Okay, so I haven't done a video on American history in a little while, so let's do one on one of the presidents. Google search US president's ranking. A few options here, we can't go wrong with Wikipedia. Let's have a look, let's have a look. Who's at the top? Oh, Roosevelt, wasn't expecting that. Well, I've done a few videos on him. Lincoln, Washington, nah, boring, let's go to the bottom. Trump, I didn't realize Wikipedia hated America. Harding, Buchanan, nah, let's look at the middle. Nixon could be good. So too Carter. I mean, there's Gerald Ford, probably the least consequential president. I'm gonna stop past me right there. And in this video, I'm hoping to show you why I was wrong about Gerald Ford and why his presidency is actually significant and quite helpful for us to understand today. If you're a regular here, you might be thinking, well, we've recently covered Xi Jinping, Putin, Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad. Why are we going back to the 70s to cover a guy who reminds you of your PE teacher and who was also only in for two years? Well, the world Gerald Ford led in the mid 70s is quite similar to the one we're going into in the mid 2020s. Inflation was high, petrol prices were high, America was navigating a withdrawal from a country its public didn't really want to be in anymore, and though he was in Nixon's party, Ford was taking over from one of the most divisive and controversial presidents of his era. With US political coverage as polarized as it is today, wouldn't it be nice if we had a case study of results to look back to in how to handle, or maybe not handle, the upcoming issues? So if you do a quick YouTube search on Gerald Ford, not much is really there. This actually puts us in a unique opportunity to be the number one YouTube search on Gerald Ford. Literally the same channel that used Palpatine from Star Wars in lieu of a Russian politician. So if you want to take control of the algorithm, give this video a like and leave a comment below with what grade you'd give Ford's presidency from A to E. So if you have no clue as to what Watergate was, essentially Republican President Richard Nixon was involved in spying on and burgling the Democrats' Watergate headquarters in Washington. This was to get information to use against and blackmail Democrat opponents. For years, Nixon denied his involvement, but eventually the Supreme Court ruled that the recording tapes that incriminated Nixon be released. Nixon fought tooth and nail to obstruct this, but when the tapes were released, it was clear that Nixon was very much involved in Watergate. Rather than be impeached, which is when Congress votes to remove the president from office for misconduct, Nixon resigned and Gerald Ford became president. Now, Nixon and Ford were old friends, and Ford had only been vice president for half a year when this happened. He'd earlier considered retiring from politics, but became Nixon's vice president on the basis of their long-standing friendship. And so when Ford entered office, he had a tough call to make. Nixon's conduct wasn't just disqualifying behavior, it was criminal. Now, obviously as president, Ford would never be in a position to prosecute the case against Nixon, but he did have the power to pardon anyone. So theoretically, he could pardon Nixon. Now, if this seems like a conflict of interest, you'd be right. They were mates, colleagues, and belonged to the same party. Ford made the decision to pardon Nixon on the basis of keeping unity across the nation. This is particularly interesting because they were the same party and Nixon didn't have much public support at this point. The most obvious comparison in the modern era is Trump and January the 6th. Now, some of the insurgents have already been criminally prosecuted, but say these charges were to reach Trump, it would be Trump relying on a Democrat president for a pardon, which they would never give, and someone with a much greater following than Nixon facing trial. In terms of how the Nixon pardon was messaged, Ford basically argued that justice needed to be suspended in the interest of national peace. But the stakes were actually much lower than what they are today. Not only that, but the 70s was the era of bad inflation. Essentially, in the build-up to the 1972 election, Richard Nixon conceded that inflation could be tolerated, but that unemployment could not. And he actually supported the increase of money supply. The Federal Reserve's M1 money supply increased from 228 billion US dollars in 1971 to 249 billion dollars in December of 1972. If you're an economic noob, firstly, welcome to the club. It's my least favorite part of history. But inflation is really bad because the dollar is devalued and so people's savings are worth less, therefore reducing their purchasing power. But the 70s wasn't just any inflation, it was stagflation. Basically, where inflation is happening alongside stagnant economic growth, so with high unemployment and stagnant wages, which is effectively a wage cut. One of the key reasons for this lagging economy was the 1973 oil crisis in which Arab nations limited their oil exports to America in response to them supporting Israel in the Yom Kippur War of 1973. So when Ford came into office, he was tasked with addressing this national economic crisis. 
Now, at the risk of losing the audience to talk about economic theory, trust me, I hate this as much as you do, but until the 1970s, people didn't think stagflation was possible. This was because inflation meant an increased money supply and therefore easier employment opportunities with plenty of cash going around. So, just like with the Great Depression, economic orthodoxy had to adapt. Previously, addressing inflation saw huge tax increases to reduce the money supply, and addressing a stagnant economy saw tax cuts to increase people's money supply. So, what did Ford do with both of these issues? Well, initially, he proposed inflation be fixed by encouraging people to spend less voluntarily and launched the WIN campaign, standing for WIP inflation now. Just listen to this speech to Congress. My conclusions are very simply stated. There is only one point on which all advisors have agreed. We must WIP inflation right now. Ford tried to play into the imagery of the Great Depression by encouraging personal sacrifice, but this was largely unreceived. If Chuck wanted a Mustang, he wasn't going to let an unelected president get in his way. Ford then pivoted to a new economic program which involved big tax hikes for corporations and high income earners. For a Republican, I can't imagine someone like Ben Shapiro being too impressed with this. With the country going into Great Recession, Ford's focus shifted from the inflation aspect of stagflation to the stagnant part of stagflation. And so in November of 1974, Ford started implementing tax reductions while also advocating for a reduction in government spending to still address inflation. However, the Democrats were the ones who held Congress and instead advocated for further tax cuts and increased government spending with a tax reduction bill. I know at this point you want to click off to what Xi Jinping saying was up Beijing, but just hang in there. I'll give that to you in just a moment. As president, Ford considered vetoing the Democrats, but ultimately let them pass the bill into law. In 1975, Ford signed the Revenue Adjustment Act to scale back the amount of government spending, and the economy started to stabilize, albeit not for too long. With Watergate and stagflation hanging over the Republicans, and with Ronald Reagan nearly pipping Ford to the Republican nomination, Ford lost the 1976 election to the Democrat peanut farmer, Jimmy Carter. But that's only half the story. Was that Beijing? So, American foreign policy in the 1970s is really interesting because of this guy, Henry Kissinger. Now, earlier this week, we released a podcast on how during Gerald Ford's era, the CIA seemed to intervene in Australian politics by lobbying our Governor General to sack our Prime Minister at the time, Gough Whitlam. We also look at the claim to have allegedly come from Ford's successor, Jimmy Carter, that America would never again intervene in Australian politics. It was a fascinating one to make, and a really quick and easy way that you can support the podcast is by giving it a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. So, the first pressing foreign policy issue for Gerald Ford was how to get out of Vietnam. Nixon and Kissinger had earlier signed the Paris Peace Accords in 1973, which was a deal to end America's intervention and keep a separate North and South Vietnam, not too dissimilar to what happened in Korea in the 1950s. And so, Ford was tasked with actually pulling off the evacuation of US troops. Again, it's crazy to see the parallels to Biden's presidency after Trump agreed to the withdrawal from Afghanistan but wasn't in to see it out. Most US forces were withdrawn under Nixon in 1973, but North Vietnam continued to make advances southward, and Nixon assured Southern leader Nguyen Van Thieu that America would help if the North broke the agreement. As a result, Ford pressed Congress to provide an aid package worth $722 million, but the Democratic-held Congress refused, wanting nothing to do with military aid. In 1975, Tu resigned as the North closed in on the capital, Saigon. Operation Frequent Wind saw the rapid evacuation of US personnel in April of 1975, and a lot of you would have seen the footage of this helicopter leaving Saigon. Secondly, Ford pursued the Cold War policy of detente. Earlier, Nixon had agreed to the SALT-1 treaty with Soviet leader Brezhnev to limit their nuclear arsenals, and Ford then also met with Brezhnev to hold further talks. Ford kept Henry Kissinger as Secretary of State, and as a result, Kissinger pursued the policy of making a friend out of Mao that had begun under Nixon. As part of detente, Ford participated in the Helsinki Accords. This was an agreement led by Europe to create something of a truce between the Soviet Union and agree to some common principles such as some human rights provisions, such as freedom of speech and religion, and an agreement not to use force to respect the sovereignty of surrounding nations. Ford was supportive of the Accords, but faced much backlash for pandering too heavily to the Soviet Union and legitimizing their control of the Eastern Bloc. 
Ford doubled down on the need to make peaceful concessions to the Soviets and actually said this in a debate against Jimmy Carter. I don't believe that the Romanians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Poles consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. Each of those countries is independent, autonomous. It has its own territorial integrity. A lot of people put this down as one of the worst failures of his re-election campaign, given how out of touch it seemed. Thirdly, remember that Yom Kippur war I told you about earlier between Israel and a number of the Arab states? Well, America had earlier intervened on behalf of Israel, but then Kissinger played the role of the mediator in negotiating a peace deal. The issue was that America felt Israel were being extremely unreasonable with their demands. Ford then wrote a scathing letter to the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, which basically said, this long-standing support we've given to you as a nation is being reconsidered because of how you've angered us. Part of this reassessment involves suspending arms aid to Israel for six months in 1975. Now, for all the noobs, being anti-Israel isn't the most popular sentiment in the American government. So, to be clear, I sometimes reference the geopolitical complexities of the topic, which is not the same as going to an anti-Semitic place. I have no stake in this. I don't either. I'm, I'm just saying, if anything, the drunk version of me is probably so supportive of Israel, he wants what's best for it and- Hey man, I'm not touching this. Also, I know it's a little bit later, but to get your finger on the pulse, this is literally what Joe Biden said about Israel in 1986. It's about time we stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body, for apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made. None. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. So Ford received a very angry response within the US government, but eventually the Sinai II agreement between Israel and Egypt was signed and aid resumed. And so I actually want to close with East Timor. Now, Indonesia was under the control of a guy called Suharto, who was supported by the US in a coup against Sukarno, who had communist alliances. Now, East Timor shared the island of Timor with West Timor, which was part of Indonesia. East Timor had seen a left-wing leader come to power, and Indonesia was concerned that that could spread to the West and create a secessionist movement. Ford and Kissinger met with Suharto and indicated that America wouldn't take a position on the issue. The next day, Indonesia invaded East Timor. So what do we make of Jared Ford's foreign policy? Well, as the guy who Steve Bradbury'd his way into the top job, he really wasn't the one with ultimate control, and I think guys like Kissinger are much more to blame for things like US-backed coups in, say, Argentina in 1976, and the sacking of Gough Whitlam in 1975. That being said, Ford was the face of US foreign policy at the time, which appeared to pursue peace with what was considered the authoritarian left, and to empower the authoritarian right in smaller countries to prevent the spread of communism. I certainly don't think that part of his presidency can be made analogous to Biden, but as your electricity bill goes up and as your petrol costs more, and as Biden is faced with the decision on whether or not to pursue a detente-like policy with China, Ford's presidency is a handy one to know. Thanks for watching. I made a lot of analogies to Biden, and if you know nothing about his presidency, you can learn all about it here. The Patreon has all sorts of new bonuses, such as getting to choose an imposter to pose as a real historical figure, and joining the podcast Discord as well as all the old bonuses like a face reveal and input on podcast and channel episodes all for just $1.50 a month. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.